Hey everyone, so I am just finishing up my PhD at St Andrews uh, and I've been working on nitrogen for the last couple of years now, um, pretty much in, in igneous systems in general, but a lot of focus on granitic systems. And today I'm hoping that I can persuade you that a specific subset of granitic systems are actually recording these sort of signatures of life um, in their nitrogen abundance and isotopic compositions. Do you want me to? Yeah. Um, so I thought I'd just start with a bit brief background as to why this might be of interest. And really it comes down to my interest in sort of understanding nitrogen cycling in general is because it is one of those elements that is essential for life. And there's a lot we don't know about it, partly because of its uh, geochemical behaviours. Initially, the, the actual initial abundance of, ice to, of, of nitrogen on Earth is really not well constrained because if you take the chondritic composition of nitrogen, when Earth accreted, it went through sort of high temperature and pressure conditions, these planetesimals all coming together. And nitrogen is one of those elements with a low condensation temperature. So basically some of it disappeared. So we can't ever really compare the totality of Earth to the totality of chondrites and, and get that initial. So it really makes mass balance calculations difficult. And, and that it also comes through to like, we still don't know a lot about the size of different reservoirs. So for instance, the atmosphere is one of the major nitrogen reservoirs on Earth at the moment. It's 78%, 79% nitrogen in the present, but we also have empirical data that suggests that the atmosphere in the Archean was either bigger, smaller, or exactly the same. So really, we, we honestly know nothing about the amount of nitrogen that was out there. And so that kind of leads you to my, my focus on the igneous crust is partly because really to balance all of these reservoirs, we either need the atmosphere, the mantle or the crust sort of in, in, in some sort of um, understanding of, of what's in those uh, reservoirs. But the atmosphere is really intransient. The mantle is really hard to sample. So it leaves you basically the crust to try and work out what's happening. Um, canonically, a lot of people do this by looking at silicoclastic sediments, but these sediments are really prone to sort of weathering over, over billions of years time scales. So we thought, why don't we go to the igneous side of the crust and in particular sedimentary derived granitoids which sort of are the intersection between magma, magmas and sediments and see whether or not they're recording any changes in the sort of nitrogen cycle through time. So I use the term strongly polarimous granites here. This is effectively the same thing as S-type granites. We, we define them relatively firmly according to a couple of criteria. So they either we, we, they need to fit at least one, but most of them fit pretty much a lot of these criteria. So they have to contain either an extra aluminous primacus phase, something like garnet is quite common in these in these granites, um, have radiogenic isotope signatures or high delta A to the O values. And usually um, we use the aluminous saturation index as a proxy of, well, as a, as a way of defining how per aluminous something is. Um, which is effectively just the amount of aluminium kind of in the system compared to compared to calcium, sodium, and potassium. Um, and really, these granites kind of tend to form at least with a significant component of crustal material. So there's a couple of processes we really need to think about before we can just say this nitrogen in this SP, in this this granite is telling you something about um, um, the sort of sedimentary cycle earlier on. So sort of initial burial metamorphism and then partial melting all processes that we need to consider and how they would impact nitrogen. Um, so if you take that a step back and just start with the initial theory, effectively what you have is a system where in the original sediment there's this organic matter. Pretty much most nitrogen sediments will probably be in the form of some organic matter. Um, commonly the isotope value is actually relatively homogeneous plus or minus a couple of per mil um, as, as one of the most dominant pathways of fixing nitrogen is through this sort of nitrate assimilation processes. So around about plus five, that's very distinct from mantle, which tends to be minus five per mil. Um, and that'll become a little bit more important going further, uh, going later. So you have this initial nitrogen content. That, that sediment is obviously going to eventually undergo some form of burial. It might even undergo extensive metamorphism. Um, problem with metamorphism is there's evidence out there that nitrogen either is totally retained or totally lost. So it really is a kind of mix between the two. Um, there's definitely evidence that nitrogen can be retained up to like 850 degrees Celsius and a couple of kilobars of pressure. So there's 
there's a good there's a good value there's a good chance that you are going to be retaining at least some of the nitrogen throughout this process um, and it will fractionate your isotopes on average around about plus two plus three per mil again variable sometimes but we are taking a broad brush approach here so we're gonna we're gonna keep going along this sort of line but actually at, at igneous sort of temp at high magmatic temperatures you tend to not have significant um deviations away from sort of nitrogen abundance or isotope values so the the fractionation at that sort of temperature should be relatively small so you, you're really inheriting your sedimentary signature fractionated by a couple of per mil you may be losing a bit of nitrogen along the way but really my argument is although the nitrogen you get in the final granite is a minimum concentration if you start with a really high value you should end with a higher value it's assuming that this process is relatively uniform and your isotop isotopic composition should be a within a couple of per mil of the original sedimentary composition. So I'll get on to some of the data. I thought I'd start first with what data exists sort of in terms of sedimentary data. So this is canonically what you do with the upper continental crust trying to work out the composition of the upper continental crust as you go to stochastic sediments and show that actually not all sediments are equal. So if you compare glacial tills, which is a widely used proxy for upper continental crust composition, you see there's a sort of step change in the amount of nitrogen. There's a lot of data gaps in here, but there is a sort of increase relatively over time from the Archean to the present day, um, which is not reflected in shales and mudstones, but that's probably because those shales are sort of shallow marine settings and there's a lot of complex sort of um, biological processes as well that end up in something that's so organic rich uh, as shales. Um, but then this it comes to my data. So this is the um, strongly polyluminous granite data through time. So in particular, the, the blue, uh, blue diamonds, are, are the new data set that we've collected. And well, as you can see, it kind of surprised me that I was getting relatively low abundances of about 10 ppm out of something that should be derived from sediments that tend to be typically quite high in nitrogen, at least in the modern day. So we see this sort of increase in nitrogen over time where we have this low abundance in the Archean, but then if you take the median value in the Phanerozoic, it seems to be increasing. There's a significant sort of increase up here. Um, so it, it raises the question is, are both tills and these granites recording similar processes? Um, and really trying to trace that idea of where this nitrogen is sourced from, we go down then the route of looking at nitrogen isotopes and trying to understand um, what that can tell us a little bit about where it's coming. Um, and so if you look at the sedimentary record through time, it has been relatively uniform. Um, this is very distinct from the mantle. So the mantle is, is, is always much isotopically depleted in 59 compared to typically the crust and in both glacial tills and, and shales, they tend to agree in terms of their average isotopic composition, at least over the, the last three billion years. Um, and actually, if you look at the, our SPG data, we end up getting about two per mil heavier, two to three per mil heavier, but also relatively uniform for the last three billion years. Um, and this is, at least if you go back to the theory, it seems to at least fit to some extent this uh, what you'd expect if you trace initial sediment burial through metamorphism to, through partial melting to solidification of the final S-type granite. Um, and so it also kind of suggests potentially that because the, 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 the sedimentary system have been sourcing biological nitrogen since at least the Archean, there's evidence for nitrogen fixation, fixation back to at least 3.2 billion years, although the biosphere was much smaller back then, there was still nitrogen fixation through biological processes. And perhaps this is suggesting that this, this granitic record is also incorporating some of this biological signa signatures. Um, but what are the implications of this? So these samples are really useful because they've also been studied in other, other elemental systems. So recently there's been a paper just come out um, where they study the phosphorus content of strongly perilumous granites. And they did the same, they said the same thing as we did. We thought, OK, we see this sort of increase in sedimentary systems. Let's take these sedimentary dry granitoids and see whether or not it's also recording this increase. So at the top is um, siliciclastic sedimentary rocks from Reinhard et al. And at the bottom is um, strongly proluminous granitoids from the Colts uh, 2022. 
And so phosphorus and nitrogen seem to be showing the same thing, this increase in abundance in the Phanerozoic. Um, <clears throat> and I thought, well, what really was happening around this time? Does this actually make sense? And I thought, OK, I'll compile together sort of all the key sort of Earth history sort of things that were happening at this time and try and link whether or not this was a tectonic thing or a biological thing or, or something else. And actually, there was a load of sort of biological innovations happening at this time. It's a little bit preceding the full evolution of plant life during the Devonian, but really fundamentally this, this, this was a time period where weathering pathways, soils and everything started properly developing. So pre pre sort of plant life, we, we would have had a, a world which was pretty much sort of open to, to weathering of continents. And that would be the main source of nitrogen going into these S-type granites would just be weathering of existing rock material. Um, but the rise of complex terrestrial biosphere also included sort of this, um, it, it allowed for the development of more complex organic rich soils. And so within soils is where you get most of the, uh, like nitrogen's com really compatible in clay minerals because it substitutes in similar to sort of potassium and rubidium. And so this development of protosoils and the massive increase in the, the overall mass of the biosphere during this time um, will have led sort of with increased clay formation, tectonic recycling, and I think this is what's being, being recorded in these sort of S-type granites. And that's why we're seeing this increase in nitrogen. Um, and so really, I just wanted to make a point that it's, at least in terms of nitrogen, it seems like some magmas are potentially re preserving this sort of history of life. And that uh, these sediments, the sediments were sourcing biological fixed nitrogen back in the Archean, and they were also getting incorporated into these sedimentary derived granitoids. So I really just wanted to make the point that actually the biosphere and the geosphere are really intimately linked. Um, so thank you. <laughs>